This is Drupal SaaS, building software as a service on Drupal. The Drupal North 2019. <clears throat> so, just to introduce myself, I'm an enterprise cloud architect. Uh, that is, I do Drupal, Agar, SaaS, Pass, SAP, IAS consulting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I won't explain what those are, because that'll take half an hour, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Use Wikipedia, it's great. Um, so, uh, I've been on Drupal.org for 13 years with Colin, uh, C-O-L-I-N. I maintain over 40 modules, not all of them actively, because I know that could be a question. Uh, uh, I worked on the first release of buyandsell.gc.ca, which is a Government of Canada procurement portal, so a lot of your companies probably try to... Oh, okay. Looks okay now. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so that so that site. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So I'm not sure why it's flickering. Just try and pretend it's not. I guess. So anyway, that site it's a procurement portal for Government of Canada. So a lot of your companies probably try to get government contracts through that. That was, I think, the first big uh, Drupal implementation in the federal government. So I worked on that. Uh, I'm a Google Summer of Code mentor, or have been for various data encryption projects in Drupal. So there's a bunch of uh, client-side encryption and server-side encryption projects that I mentored students uh, for. It's kind of neat. I'm a core maintainer of the Agar hosting system, which you can't see right now because the screen keeps flickering. If anybody knows any of the media people, feel free to grab them or ping them or something because I don't know what's going on here. I, know. I believe everything's plugged in, so I'll just ignore that. All right, so I'm a founding partner of Consensus Enterprises, which is my new firm I have with some other folks. Uh, we do a bunch of different things, um, generically helping you do big things in the cloud. Uh, DevOps processes, documentation, uh, self-hosted multi-site solutions, audits, site audits, application lifecycle management, continuous integration and delivery. Uh, cloud infrastructure, architecture, uh, and software as a service engineering. That's pretty much what we do. Some ground rules for this talk, uh, interrupt me at any time. It's kind of an open source thing. Jump in, add your feedback, ask questions, all that kind of stuff. You can actually follow along on the website uh, if you want. I'm assuming that site works. Uh, that's where this is. So I'm actually using, accessing that now. It's actually uh, Hugo is the static site generator we use for this, so it's, it's up there. Uh, and so a lot of the slides, you're going to see some of these things I'm talking about. They're actually links. They're orange. Uh, for, those, for those of you that aren't colorblind. Uh, so feel free to, yeah, if you want to go there, you can click on things. If you want to go off and you know, check out um, certain links I'm, I'm talking about, feel free to do that. Uh, I've got a Creative Commons license, so you can reuse some of this stuff if you want. All right, so um, how many of you are considering building a SaaS product? Anybody here? One, two, couple, cool. Uh, currently working on a SaaS product? So that's a good number, that's four or five, great. And anybody already selling one? Does anyone have one in production? Not yet, because they already know what they're doing, they don't need to come here, oh, you do that? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, or did, did anyone realize they're supposed to be somewhere else? You're in the wrong room? No? Okay, good. Uh, excellent. Yeah, so anybody, um, are, are there any other interests in SaaS? Like, why are, please? Yeah, yeah. so uh, Drupal distributions, uh, uh, there's multi, multiple websites uh, from a, a single code base yep. for like one client, and how the usability of those distribution can help that client. Uh, right. Kind of Business. Right, so Drupal multi-site, basically how you can run a bunch of sites together. Great, perfect. Any other, uh, another com yeah, shoot. I work for the government, and okay. we run a lot of sites. Staff camp. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just looking at angles that we could do that kind of internally. Yeah. Or maybe to other departments, so. Yeah, actually. I, we're doing some work for another department, so let's talk after. If you want to help? Sure. I can talk about what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, great. Cool. So um, excellent. So uh, it's like the business aspects. You have a product. It's it's a bit different than a project. So normally with you know website project, you do a bit of work, you get paid. You do another one, you get paid. Um, if you're building a product, there's a lot. It takes a lot more time to build something like that with a subscription model. So 
Uh, it's different than development contracts. As you can imagine, you don't, you don't really get paid up front. Like, you have to do a whole bunch of work before money can start coming in. So there's, there's a, you know, a lot of unpaid work to get your platform built. Uh, so you sort of need to have a plan for keeping the lights on, getting paid, that kind of thing. So what we're doing, like, we've actually, we're actually you know, working on some SaaS products as well as doing consulting. And uh, we're trying to bootstrap it, like, fund it from our consulting work. Now that obviously is not as fast as finding a venture capitalist or you know, having a, a rich uncle or you know, that kind of thing, investors. So these are just things you, know, you have to think about when you're, when you're working on the business aspect. Obviously you're not all here for that, but that's uh, something to keep in mind for that use case, right? So like I said, lots of development, you may not get regular income for this type of thing. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, <laughs> money should come in if, if, if you can sell it, right? I mean, that's what it's all about, right? So, um, great, so let's talk a little bit about hosting. Now, so there are a bunch of Drupal hosting companies which have some pros, right? So you can outsource your infrastructure, you don't have to worry about any of that. Simplify site maintenance, that's often done for you. I know some of them, you need to click a button, you get the latest you know, version of Drupal core, that's great. Uh, there's some cons though, so vendor lock-in, like you're generally stuck with a particular vendor. Uh, it might not always be easy to export and import somewhere else, especially if you've written you know, infrastructure as code, that kind of thing, that's not portable. Uh, you don't have control over hosting costs. So if you get locked in somewhere and their prices start skyrocketing, what do you do, right? So another thing to think about, a data center location. So this is an issue in Canada because of privacy laws. Uh, for Americans, it's not, I guess, too big of a deal. Uh, but here, so you don't have, I mean, yeah, you might not have control over data centers. Right? So if you go with one of the Drupal hosting companies, usually you don't get to choose what country that's in, right? So I know with, um, in Canada, there are gonna be times when you wanna, you need, your customer data needs to be, uh, not necessarily in Canada, but you know, you, your users need to consent to whatever you do with that data. And that won't work in the States, generally, because either government can get access to any data at any time, and you don't even know that that's happening, and users can't consent to it, and so you might want to think about you know, having uh, where you want to put your data centers. Uh, so configuration as code. So this is using tools like you know, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Salt, these kind of things, where you, know, you use your code to, as infrastructure to spin up VMs, that kind of thing. Uh, if, it's, if that's written for a particular vendor, then you, know, you're gonna, you might get locked into that. Not great, right? Uh, so in a lot of these companies, uh, they don't support multi-site. And that's actually very explicit with most of them. And I'm not sure why it is, but that's the way it is. And so like we started talking about, you mentioned you, know, you, often, you might want to run multi-site and have a whole bunch of sites using the same code base. A lot of the vendors don't, uh, don't support that, or at least the Drupal hosting companies. So, and also, cost is another thing to think about. So cost per site, a lot of these companies will charge you say 60 month per site. So if you've got 200 and the same code base, you're paying for 200 sites. Whereas opposed, you know, you, you would want it to scale, the more sites you have, the cheaper it gets, but it doesn't work that way with these folks, unfortunately. So infrastructure. So there's proprietary infrastructure as a service, and by that I mean things like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Services, Microsoft Azure. These are things that are very popular now. But again, it's proprietary, it's not open source. So OpenStack is sort of the IIS implementation that won. Some other options were um, Ganity, which is a Google thing, and uh, CloudStack. But OpenStack seems to have sort of taken over now. So I think uh, Rackspace really put a lot of effort into that. So yeah, no vendor lock-in, it's open source. You can you know take it and uh, you can install it on your own infrastructure, your own data center if you want. Say you know, you're in the government, you're in a big company, you don't want to go externally. Uh, OpenStack is, that's the big one now, like I was saying. So there are a lot of uh, different uh, hosting companies running OpenStack. So you know, where you normally, you know, you can go to AWS or GCS. The companies that are running OpenStack and you just, like any other hosting company, you just pay them and it's running on OpenStack and you just do what you have to do, spin up the end, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of, so I've worked with several OpenStack uh, hosting companies, and they often don't have data in and out charges. So like with AWS, I don't know how many of you know, but they'll often, you pay a lot of money getting your data, uploading your data, getting it out, that kind of thing. 
And that can be very expensive. So with a bunch of these companies, the ones I've worked with at least, uh, they, they only charge you for storage, which is great. So you can save a lot of money. Like if you, people uploading things, downloading things, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, your configuration as code. Uh, again, that would be you know, like Ansible code, that kind of thing. Uh, that is a standard API for OpenStack. So if you want to switch vendors, it doesn't matter. You can reuse that on any other OpenStack vendor. If they jack up the price, you move somewhere else. Uh, for as, as opposed to, say, you can't switch from AWS to Azure very easily if all your code is written for those APIs. So something to watch out for. Uh, data centers in various countries. So there's actually, uh, if you go to the OpenStack, I don't have the URL in front of me, but if you search for OpenStack Marketplace, on the website, they actually, you can search by country, by service, uh, for OpenStack providers. And they have different services, databases of service, VMs, whatever, uh, that kind of thing. <coughs> yeah, data portability. So like I said, switching between vendors, your, you can, your I, I, I infrastructure as code, sorry, IEC, uh, you can move that between vendors easily. You can also do the same with your uh, data, not just your code. So you can export your VMs from some company and then import them into another company that's running OpenStack, which is great. Uh, more control over hosting costs, right? So again, you know, you, you have various companies to choose from. But now let's talk hosting system, right? The platform as a service, I guess. Uh, do you need to write one from scratch? And you don't. So we've got some software that does that. Uh, there's something called Agar, which you may or may not have heard of. Has anyone heard of Agar and know about it? I see a lot of hands. Anyone not heard of it? One, two, okay, a few people. Uh, so it's, it was originally written to host and manage provision Drupal sites. So the, the, I think the 11th anniversary just went by, it's been around a long time. Uh, it's, so it's open source, uh, it's, yeah, like I said, 10 plus years, right? So it's got a web services API, so it can do a lot of things. Uh, soon it'll be able to host anything, so Agar 3 is stable right now. So Agar 5, which is currently in development, which some of us are working on, that um, the idea there is to replace the provisioner. Um, so it, it's been historically it's been Drush, which works great for Drupal, but for everything else. So we're actually replacing Drush with Ansible. So we should be able to provision anything. So any kind of thing you want to host, you should be able to do with Agar 5, uh, which is great. I don't want to talk too much about that, but that's where it's going. So good to know. And all right. So oh, I did this already. All right. Anybody using Agar? No, just me? I know you were. <laughs> I have the various times. Right. Cool. So, so that's the hosting system. So what that is, is that, that gives you sort of the back-end hosting infrastructure, right? So you would sort of you know, tell that, okay, I need a new site. It would spin one up. I want to take one down. I want to upgrade my sites. I want to run backups on a site, all that kind of stuff. So... Um, often you would want to integrate that with, say, e-commerce. You know, how do you get your clients to pay, if that's a thing for you? Uh, your recurring billing, right? You have subscriptions. How's that going to work? Right? So, so there's a module that I've been working on the last uh, couple of years when I have time. Uh, it's called Eager Site Subscription, so that's a link. So it's a Drupal.org module. <coughs> and so that adds e-commerce to the Eager ecosystem by associating hosted sites with customer subscriptions via recurring billing. It communicates with the Agri API over web services. So let's say you had a Drupal 8 site. Uh, that was you know, your customer-facing dashboard, your marketing site. Uh, clients would, you know, they, customers would create an account there. Uh, they, would, they would pick the plan they wanted. They would you know, enter their credit card number, all that stuff. You know, they'd hit go, and then you know, you'd send a message to your Agar backend to say, yeah, spin up a site for these folks. Uh, or if they stop paying, their credit card fails eventually, then you can just delete it. Uh, or if you don't want to be that mean, you can keep it around and then, sorry? Suspend it. Suspend it, yeah, that's probably safer. Uh, depends on your policy, right? Something to think about, definitely. <clears throat> so yeah, I talked a little bit about this, select a plan. Uh, you know, provide your payment info, provision the site, you know, can get deleted later, or you can keep it. Send it to them if they finally do pay you. If not, don't, I guess. 
So um, the way it works, it's sort of a, it acts as a plugin manager, right? So it, it allows you to yeah, okay, so it allows you to choose different subscription providers. So the big one that it works with now, that was sort of the reference implementation that I got it working with was Recurly. I don't know who's heard of that or not, but it basically allows you to manage subscriptions online. So whether you want to use PayPal or Stripe or anything like that to actually do the payment processing, uh, Recurly would sit between you and those uh, to sort of handle the recurring billing, the dunning. Uh, dunning is basically how to handle what happens when a customer's credit card fails, like do you send them emails, how many times do you try before giving up, that kind of thing, so that's a dunning process. Uh, yeah, exactly, so, yeah, so Recurly's done, so that's great, uh, pretty much, there's a prototype up and running, so, you know, more, a lot more people to try it, test it, that kind of stuff. Uh, commerce recurring framework, so commerce is, basically, for those that don't know, it's sort of the big, a commerce framework in Drupal. So there's a, they've got a plugin called the Commerce Recurrent Framework, which tries to do a lot of that subscriptions management stuff within Drupal, so that you don't need a third party service. Because if you're using, say, Recurly, you need to pay your payment processor, they take a cut, like Stripe or PayPal, then Recurly takes a cut, plus a fee, right? And then you do everything else in Drupal. If you can do the, you know, the subscription stuff in Drupal, Drupal handles the dunning, subscriptions, all that kind of stuff, then you know, you can, cut down one service provider, which is great. Uh, that's not done yet, so I'd like to work on that, uh, but I need funding. So I'm not working on that because nobody's paying me right now, but uh, it'd be great to get that done at some point. And there are many other options. There are tons of these providers, and you know, we'd love to have, have support for that eventually. Uh, some things to think about, and so this applies more generally, you know, outside of the business use case, can be applicable for government, is, uh, you know, how do you want to handle installation profiles, uh, which in Drupal is sort of, you know, different, you know, pre-configured versions of Drupal. So uh, you can have, or, or, yeah, distributions, installation profiles, you kind of use those interchangeably. Uh, so you can, you know, you can have sort of base, a base configuration that could apply across all your platforms, which is Agar speak for a Drupal code base. So you want to have a standard code base. You can have different ones for different use cases. Um, now within each one, or within multiple, there's the features module in Drupal, which lets you basically package configuration and reuse that in different places. So you could have, say, instead of having, say, multiple installation profiles or distros, you could have one with like a common kernel and then use the features module to um, turn on different features within different use cases using the same installation profile. So that's, these are some things to think about. Uh, resource quotas. So one thing you may want to think about, whether you're in government or private sector or whatever, is well, you don't want your customers to, you know, upload gigaclouds of data that you know and you know blow through your infrastructure, right? So, uh, resource quotas uh, is a thing to worry about. I do have a module called Site Quota Enforcer, uh, which right now what that does is it's a framework to add different quotas for different things. But right now it um, cuts off your. You can't add more users if you're at your limit. So there's a user quota and there's a storage quota. So you can set what you whatever you want that to be. And your clients, when they're using their sites, um, they won't be able to pass that. If they try to add new content, they'll get a nice error message saying, sorry, you've, you're out of disk space, basically. Contact your admin, get a bigger plan, that kind of thing. Uh, admin access. So in the SaaS context, things are a bit different from a normal, you know, you build a site, you hand it off to a client, they're the owner, that kind of thing. Uh, with SaaS, um, it works a little bit differently. You would typically want, um, I guess sort of the hosting company say, if I've got a SaaS product, I'm selling it to you, I would be, you know, user one, the super user on the site, so I could do admin things, turn modules on, turn them off. But the site owner, which isn't a great term, but it, it kind of works, would be your customer that's subscribing, uh, subscribing to the site because you're providing it to her, right? So you'd want that person not to have full access to the site, but some access. So you have to think about things like you know, restricting the permissions. You don't, want, you don't want your customers to go and turn on modules and turn them off. Say, turn off your quota enforcer module, and then they can do whatever they want, right? So, so yeah, user one versus owner role. Yeah, so user one can do everything in Drupal, so you would want, probably want your um, customers to be user two, and then they can delegate down from there, create their own users. A permission subset will 
take the, you know, the big permissions page in Drupal and shrink that to whatever you want, and you can give that to your customers, and then they can delegate a subset of permissions, which I think is a much safer way to do it. So uh, the story with that is it's there for Drupal 7, but there's no Drupal 8 for it yet. So that's another thing uh, that would need to get done for this, for this type of thing. All right, customer service. So you, know, you, you obviously need to interact with your clients in some fashion outside of providing them with the service. So, you know, you'd, you'd want a public-facing issue tracker. Uh, GitLab has something called Service Desk. You know, everyone knows GitLab for, like, GitHub for hosting code. They have a Service Desk feature which lets you turn, like, emails into, into tickets or issues. That's one option. There are various tools to do that. That's, I won't go into that too much because, uh, you know, just trying to touch on these issues. Things to think about, right? Yeah, if you're already using GitLab, this might not be a bad option. Uh, most people are. So I don't know if this is a bit of an aside, but uh, when, when it was announced that Microsoft bought GitHub, uh, GitLab.com actually went down because everyone was trying to move their stuff over. So, <laughs> kind of a funny story. So the, it's, GitLab actually has more features than GitHub right now, so it's, it's, getting, it's getting more popular. Uh, it's open source. You can run it yourself, or at least the community edition. Uh, so that's... That's why it's fairly popular. Is any, um, yeah, anyone else have, have thought about this? Do they, what, are, what are some good things to do for customer service? Any, anyone thought about it yet or not really? RT. RT, yeah, okay. So that, that's like a big, proprietary, like that's a, been around a long time, a standard tool, right? Do you wanna? It's proprietary, it should be open source. It's, it is open source. Open source email ticket tracking. Right? Open source email ticket tracking, okay. So, so just email. Right. But. It's something, it's, great. Yeah. Okay, so RT is another option. Good to know. I think that's probably good. I have heard of that one. I just forgot to mention it. So that's that's sort of the you know a uh, little bit of a summary of all these things to think about when dealing with these kinds of issues in the Drupal ecosystem. So yeah, I mean, I'd love to keep talking about this. We still have some time. Uh, so yeah, any feedback, some questions, thoughts, comments? You know, let's let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, can you clarify the the um kind of the, the roles of OpenStack versus a gear uh, what, what part deploys infrastructure? Is it OpenStack? Is it a Yeah, so that's a good question. So what I should have had was an architecture, like technical architecture diagram. I'll, maybe I'll do that next time. But um, your infrastructure as a service would be things like, you know, OpenStack, which, you know, you can either go with a company or you can run it yourself in your own data center on your own hardware. So that's the infrastructure. That would be, you know, in the same class as, you know, it's, it's OpenStack or AWS or Azure, uh, DigitalOcean, any of these services, right? That's all infrastructure, uh, whether it's virtual or not, right? And of course, you can just run it on hardware and not have the virtual aspect. So then I guess the platform, so that would kind of sit at the bottom layer, right? Your infrastructure, then your sort of platform layer would be um, basically Agar, right? Because that is not infrastructure, but it's not the actual application that the users are running into, but it, it's a platform um, that provides the software, that you, it hosts the software as a service that you care about or that your clients care about. That would be installed on, on, a, on a server like uh, Web uh, Right, so you, so you would say go and take Agar uh, and install that on a VM at DigitalOcean or uh, you know, AWS or whatever, right? So that's your platform. So the, you know, the platform sits on the infrastructure, uh, you know, it, you install it, you can, you know, Agar is pretty easy to install nowadays. It's, you know, sudo apt install Agar 3, for example. But, you know, you, it depends on the setup you have. That would just give you the default installation. Uh, so, yeah, the platform, you know, would be Agar. And then that would host the sites that the clients interact with. So that's the software. So can, you, can Agar deploy sites on other uh, virtual machines or deploy a container, let's say, or something like that? Can yeah, so there's actually, so in Agar 3, which is stable now, there are a bunch of modules to do that. I think there's Agar Cloud. So what they do, they can actually spin up VMs and other. Um, the, what we're actually looking at with Agar 5, which isn't out yet, is that'll happen much more natively, right? So you, you'll be able to click on, you know, I want to spin up you know, this, this whole system with a load balancer and two web heads and database and that's running a Galera cluster and all this kind of stuff. So um, that'll be much easier to spin up the next one. So now we're kind of, we've got some modules that kind of do it, but it's not really core. Uh, so yeah, but it, it can do that. Typically the way, the way you'd use Agar now in Agar 3 is you would create a server however you would normally do it manually or, you know, you'd go in DigitalOcean, click on all one, three VMs, one to database. 
then what you do is you tell Eager where your servers are. That's how it works now. So you would say, okay, I want to, you know, click on servers, add server. Okay, you know, here's the dom here's the you know domain name, here's the SSH key, that kind of stuff, right? So then, once Eager knows about it, it can provision sites onto, it can provision a platform onto that server, and then it'll provision sites onto that platform. And by platform, uh, in this context, I mean like a Drupal code base. So that's that's the term Eager uses for. So it's basically a Drupal code base without the sites directory. So that's an Eager platform. So when you install sites onto an Eager platform, it just creating a site directory and sticking it in the, in the platform or in the code base, right? So that's, yeah, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. and I have a follow-up question. Uh, does it deploy as well, like, dependencies for Drupal, like PHP and... Uh, yeah, so like if you just run, and, uh, if you just run, like, sudo apt install Eager 3, it'll pull in PHP and, by default, uh, Apache and MySQL, but, you know, you can run MariaDB or you can run uh, Nginx. I like Nginx, so even though Apache is the default, yeah. I talked a bit. I'm Dan. I'm also with, with Consensus. I work with Colin and, and the other guys. Nice to see you. I'm Hi. <laughs> new to this community, but Hi, Dan. Can I, talk, can I also mention? Do you want to men mention where we're going with the Eager policy, or can I discuss? This yeah, topic? please. Uh, do you want to come up? I don't know if they can hear you for the mic, but uh, uh, sure. So, um, yeah. So where where we're we going? Um, just just to follow up on the answer to the question. Nice to see everybody. So what we're uh, what we're working on is kind of the next step with this. So remember, a really key thing to understand for those of you who don't know what Eager is exactly, without having an architecture diagram here, is that it's just a Drupal application itself. It just happens to be one that knows how to manipulate other Drupal applications. Um, so what's nice about that is you get that sort of warm, comfy, I know how to use this thing feeling if you're a Drupal person. Uh, especially if you're familiar with Drush right now, because that's kind of the basis for, for Eager 3. However, in the move towards Eager 5, what we're doing is we're swapping out all the Drush stuff with Ansible. And the nice thing about that is that Ansible is much more platform and technology agnostic in all directions. And also, oh, it is so extensible, given that it's Ansible. And so what you can, what we're working on right now is um, a generic way to have an Ansible role that's going to be what's called an eager policy that basically just says, this, this sort of comes back to your question, I think, um, that for this particular install of eager, we're going to be using Nginx versus Apache, right? So anything that's not the standard eager um, base config that comes out of what you would get today from the, the dev package, let's say, um, anything that you would want to be different, you'll be able to package that as an eager, as, a, um, as an Ansible role. Uh, of your own, uh, and then you just use it, you just have it as a dependency within the whatever role you're using to install Eager itself, you know, from another, from Ansible. Um, you know, I want these modules, these Eager modules enabled, maybe you want the remote site import stuff that, um, you know, allows you to move sites or to copy sites, deploy sites from one Eager installation to another one. Uh, so that's useful for things like migrating code from, let's say, dev to QA to production. Right, so there's all these different modules within Eager that can do that stuff, whereas in production, you know, you might want a very stripped down, closed down version of Eager running that doesn't expose a lot of stuff, or you may, or just has a lower kind of resource footprint. So for efficiency, so for a lot of the, uh, that kind of configurability will be available within this kind of this Ansible role. Yeah, there, like roles, roles in Ansible define variables. So one can be web server, right. and the default might be Apache, but you can change it and say, oh, no, I want Nginx, want Nginx. right? So, so there'll be, it'll be a lot more customizable. Uh, and uh, it'll also allow you, so, so we're working on ways to support newer versions of, uh, so we already support D8 today with Anger, um, and we're going to be adding support for other stuff as well. So yeah. I hope that answers. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I think, I can't remember if the, you know, the Anger policy role is not on our public facing GitLab repo. Yet. Maybe yeah, yeah. Yeah. Next week, I'll, I'll get that. Okay. So. Yeah. Just to add to that, like Ansible, for those that don't know, it's it's a command line tool. So you can tell, you know, on the command line, you can type, you know, I want to provision, you know, these VMs at this, you know, hosting company. What so what Eager gives you, it's sort of like a web front end to that. So the whole idea is, um, just to back up way back, Eager is basically a web front end for DevOps. So if you're using Eager, you don't have to do any command line DevOps anymore. Like you. 
you know, in the old days, you'd have to do, you know, Drush, SQL, Sync, you know, you dump your database in production, update your, your dev and staging. Agar, get, you don't have to do that anymore. That's, that's gone because you just point and click from the web front end. So it's basically two components. There's a front end Drupal site, which is your point and clicky interface, and then Drush, so a bunch of custom Drush commands, which are your back end provisioning system. So there's also a queue. So you do something in the front end, it adds, it adds a task to the queue, and then that gets provisioned by Drush. Right? So in the future, that'll be Ansible, mm -hmm. which means it can't only do Drupal-y things, it can do anything. Right. Like so Ansible can provision like whatever you want. You have yeah. a Django site, you could have a Joomla, you could have a, something else, that you do Tom, Tomcat, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is really going to be breaking open into a much more... Yeah. Yeah. You, could, you could get Agar to provision Agar. Yeah. And, does, yeah. Does it mean that uh, you could build your own uh, pipeline with the domain testing with yes. this new code? Uh, yeah. I mean, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't, Igor itself isn't going to provide that, right? You would have whatever Travis or Circle CI right. or Jenkins. But, but Igor, it's always, I mean, from day one, it had hooks into the, like API hooks, right. just as Drupal always had. So at any point, you can, all, like, before Igor provisions a site, there's a hook, I think a hook pre provisioned site, and you know, you implement that in your, your custom module. And you can say, oh, before I install a site, go and do this other thing. And you can say, after a site is installed, I want to do something. Yeah. So there are hooks throughout the system in Agar. Uh, that was the old Agar, and the new one, obviously, we're going to do the same thing, because people want to be able to do whatever they want with the system. That's so right. you, know, you can definitely hook in your whole CI, testing suite, whatever you want. And you can say, on provisioning, like pre-site pre provisioning or post-site provisioning, you can say, OK, run all these tests. If any of them fail, consider the process a fail and roll back. So Agar 3 now, when you try to upgrade a site and it fails, it just rolls back to where it was before. You don't lose anything. Yes. So that's a really cool feature that, yeah. But currently that's on the same servers. You might not want to run uh, uh, tests on, your, on the, the server where you have your production, production site. That, right, yeah. yeah. So you do this on staging environment, for example. Like, you do, I mean, that, that's another talk. But <laughs> for dev staging and in Agar, you'd have three Agar instances. You'd have your dev Agar, your staging Agar, and your prod Agar. Uh, and you know you do that kind of stuff on staging, I guess, right? And then you know to when you move sites around, there's a remote import module, and you can just move sites between Agar environments. Like one Agar can pull in sites from another one, and that's how you handle the whole, you know, a deployment, dev yeah. staging prod. And you know. know about each other. Yeah, they all. Yeah, exactly. So, so the way, yeah, and that's done in a really secure way. It uses SSH keys. So there's no funny business with web services and OAuth or any of that nonsense. It's just SSH keys. So it's, it's, SSH keys. <coughs> yeah. it's very You set that up in the back end and then the front end can make them talk to each other. The main, so. the main, the main goal with Agar is to make stuff, make the easy stuff easy when you want it to be easy and straightforward, mm -hmm. but to also allow you to get as far into the weeds of customization and extension as you want to get. So we're, we're trying to... Yeah, like the, the slogan was... It's an easy path, and then, but it's also... Highly extensible and flexible. The slogan for Agar was always tools, not policy. Right. So here's a bunch of stuff. Instead of having to write a bunch of scripts to you know do your DevOps, we provide you know that's provided, but it doesn't set policy for you. Whatever you decide what your policy is, then you configure Agar to do that, right? And so I'll, I'll, we're going to do that in Agar five, right? So yeah. so or, you know. are there any other? I mean, this yeah, turned, sorry, this that was turned a bit into of a, an Agar five, yeah. which is not what we meant to do, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of questions. Someone else? Let's, let's, we'll come, come back to you. Sorry. You're, you're, you're talking about the uh, Agar 5 you got the 10th time frame? <laughs> so, Real soon now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like with most open source... <laughs> with, yeah, I was just about to say. So with normal open source projects, it's whenever it's ready. Now, whenever it's ready is determined by several factors, including funding, right? So if we have, you know, clients or partners of folks that want to do that and they provide funding for us or not funding but they provide code like you know you can either provide code or funding or whatever then it'll move along faster right the more help we have or testing exactly so you know funding code testing documentation that's a big thing right so we're we're very pro documentation so if folks are interested in helping with that in various ways it'll it'll get done faster right but acre 3 is stable now and works with drupal and actually, there's some plugins for WordPress and some of CRM, because we're tricking Agar into thinking it's Drupal when it's not, and that's why it works. It was written a long time ago. Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 on the same Agar? Yes. Absolutely. We so, that today. so that's typically what we do like, for our clients, that are, like, where we're uh, hosting Agar for them or, or helping them manage their own Agar, where we set up, we installed it. Um, 
typically we'd have one platform called, you know, say Drupal 7, you know, at a timestamp, right? And so all the Drupal 7 sites will be there, hosted on that one code base. Say, for example, you know, they've got, they're using different modules, but they don't all have to be turned on for every site. It, right? sounds, it sounds like we, we need an eager talk where we actually run through what it can do for people. It seems like this. Yeah, sorry, so maybe, maybe next yeah. year. But yeah, there's, it's, check it out. I mean, we're not, it's not a product of ours. It is just an open, we happen to have a couple of core maintainers in our team. There are other core maintainers in other parts of the Drupal community who also contribute. And like, like Colin yeah, said, we're, we're very happy to uh, have more folks contribute because the most, more folks that are contributing yeah. to it, the better it's going to get. And the broader set of needs, it'll, uh, it'll be able to tackle. <laughs> What happened before? What happened to Agar 4? That's a good question. So that's the same kind of question as what happened to PHP 5. Right. <laughs> no, PHP 6, six sorry. Six. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of a long story, but it's kind of like, you know, someone, someone started going on that and kind of went in a different direction and some other folks wanted to go in and that, that sort of, I guess the short answer is that's not a bad solution temporarily. It's, it's changing a few things. But we thought, well, let's rewrite the whole, because the problem with Agar, it's got code still from PHP 4, when it was, <laughs> I think, like, way back, right? So this is early days of Drupal. So um, what, what, you know, Agar 4 was doing was, it was replacing the back end with, like, doing Symfony stuff, right? Which is great, Drupal 8's doing that. But the, the front end is still just Drupal 7, right? So we're like, well, we, like, Let's start over the whole clean. Drupal 8, you know, we've got new APIs, we can do, you know, web services, REST, more natively, all this kind of stuff. So a, a long-term maintainer. Yeah, so it's kind of like, like ah. you know, th th there's Agar 4, but it's, there's basically one person working on it, right? So in Agar 5, there's a lot more interest. There are a few more of us uh, looking at doing that. It's a clean slate, kind of starting over, and, and yeah. So that's, yeah. Any, uh, yeah, shoot. So, so to go back to the SaaS architecture. Sure. <laughs> so uh, we, we talked about um, so the infrastructure, how we're going to host it and everything, but we haven't touched uh, development and source control. And um, so it's one thing to have one site with, let's say, one repository, but do you have a different approach you recommend for something more, um, more large? Do you, do you want yeah, I mean, the, the, way, the way these kind of things scale is if you have one code base and everybody's using it. Right. So. The, the magic to make that work is Drupal multi-site. Like the fact that Drupal Core supports multi-site, that's what makes this possible. Because if you have 200 customers that are running on you know, a shared code base, uh, and you know, Agar lets you upgrade all of them at once with a button click, like you, if, if they're all running different code bases, because if Drupal multi-site didn't exist, you manually have to upgrade each. Now there's only one Git repo you're updating, right, right. and 200 customers get all the benefits, right? So, right. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean, um, if you have, if like, let's say, custom ADR modules, and you have uh, some custom code for your infrastructure, yeah. uh, etc., would you separate all of this, or just throw it all in one big repository? It, it depends on what you're aiming to do. You have to think about how you want to use it in the future. Yeah. Like, you, you probably have a private repo with Agar, uh, customizations for your Agar installation or for your SaaS that's, installation. That, that's, and, and the fact that we were noticing that pattern of doing it that way over and over again was what led us to build this idea of an Agar policy. That's going to be something that any, that, and we're, we're going to release it generically and then folks folk can customize that locally as much as they want to. But that would then become something that you can use to install Agar the way that you want it to be built. And then what's nice is you can actually have multiple Agar policies depending on so for example, if you have five different clients and they actually have different needs in terms of a lot of the stuff we were talking about before, you can uh, customize it with the use of a different policy for each client, let's say. Right. Like, right. Yeah. like for example, uh, by default, Agar, like Agar takes over your web server configuration. So by default, it doesn't let you upload, users upload files more than like two, meg, two megabytes, right? Mm -hmm. So usually the first thing I do, I do on most Agar projects is, okay, I have, you know, a, custom Agar module and I like change that to like five or ten or whatever the client needs, right? So that, that's a small example, but you, like I said, you know, you can write modules to change any part of the config or whatever it's doing. It's just, you know, it's, it's a framework, right? Just like Drupal is a framework. So this is, you know, a SaaS framework, right? So same idea. So, yeah. So I was thinking because some of those configurations are kind of really intimately related to 
your SAS, your application. Oh, exactly, right. And that's why you'd have custom private modules. To, yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, for Drupal sites, you're usually going to have a, a custom module for that, you know, where it's got its own theme and this kind of stuff. So same, same with the platform level, right? I'm noticing that it's noon, so we may want to continue this conversation over lunch uh, for anyone interested. Right, isn't it now? Do we have until, is it 12 or 12? Oh, yeah, I guess it's over time. It's noon. 12. Yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone. Yeah, please come and talk to us after.